Numa Om Vishnu Vidaya Krishna Pastaya Bhutale Shumakti Bhakti Viranta Swami Tinami Namaste Saraswati Deve Gorvani Pachari Ne Nirishisa Sinyavari Pastyatya De Sitari Ne Manchi Kalpati Rubischa Kripa Sindhu Ve Vacha Patita Anam Pavane Vyo Vaishnave Vyo Namaha Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasudhi Gaur Bhakta Vindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Um Okay so uh and I know there has been somewhat of a break between the verses under discussion, so, but I thought it'd be a, nice for those devotees who have been following along, I hope most of you have, and uh, to complete these eight verses, these last three verses are a little bit on the higher levels of the intimacy of love for Krishna and the symptoms that characterize, characterize these stages of bhakti. As we mentioned, there are three categories, sadhana bhakti, bhava bhakti, and prema bhakti. Sadhana bhakti consists of two categories within itself, and that is Vaidhi Bhakti and Raganuga Bhakti. Vaidhi Bhakti takes you through the first four or five stages, actually. Raganuga starts to manifest on this, this the uh, sixth stage of Bhakti. I mean, on the fifth stage of Bhakti and starts to become fruitful on Ashyakti spontaneous attraction to Krishna and spontaneous attraction to chanting Krishna's holy name and spontaneous attraction to serving the Lord according to one's uh, prescribed nature. That's our Shakti. And uh, now this next stage, this is begins the platform of bhava, bhava bhakti, and bhava bhakti is the stage we all should aspire to get to because it is the preliminary stage of love of God. If you can make it to bhava bhakti in this life, then your Krishna consciousness is fully successful. And this is symptomized, and we'll speak about some of the characteristics that are exhibited, both in activity and in personality expression on the stage of Baba. So this verse is from the Anchalila of Chaitanya Charitamrita, verse chapter 20 and verse number 36. Nayanam Gladarasudaraya. Vaddanam gadgada rudaya gira Ulakayar nichitam vapukada tamanam agrahame bhavishuti Translation, my dear Lord, when will my eyes be beautified by filling with tears that constantly glide down as I chant your holy name? When will my voice falter and all the hairs of my body stand erect in transcendental happiness as I chant your holy name. Hmm. And so this is a, a symptom of love or aspiring for that loving mood, but at the same time feeling that loving mood, wanting that loving mood to increase. Um, when will my eyes be you know, filled with tears? My voice falters. The hairs of my body stand on it, right? And it's all centered around chanting the holy names. 
keep in mind that this whole process of bhakti is centered around two things. The advancement centers around two aspects, chanting the holy name and serving the Lord according to one's nature. So we could divide all activities into these two categories. Of course, chanting the holy names also means chanting his, his qualities, his forms, his pastimes. But the name is the foundation, which is the process which takes one from one stage to another, ultimately to the stage of love of God. This is important to understand because it's the holy name is actually the foundation for everything in our spiritual practice. And developing the holy name means developing a type of intimacy in chanting the holy name. And here this intimacy is explained in this particular verse. This verse is a longing and it's also described that there are symptoms of ecstasy that come Baba, it affects the mind and the life there, or prana. Prana moves through the body, and when, it, when it's in contact with earth, water, fire, and air, it exper experiences different types of ecstatic symptoms. Mm -hmm. This is a little bit technical, but this life there becomes connected to the elements and in that connection with the elements, these are transformations of one's consciousness that develops according to how the prana or the life air connects with the different elements. So there'll be shivering in the body, standing on hairs on end, uh, changing colors, uh, rolling on the ground, uh, crying, uh, so many, there's eight, eight sattvic abhavas or eight major symptoms that can come with the contact of the prana when it's affected by mm, the, the feelings of love for Krishna. Because prana is the life there. As soon as prana is gone from the body, you are no longer there anymore. Prana is the balancing force that keeps the body going. Everything depends on prana. And the, uh, the uh, soul is situated on the life airs also. So if the life airs move, the soul can also be affected in that way. And therefore, that, that the soul's effectiveness, the being affected by the movements of the life airs, experiences different kinds of symptoms. Just like we might use a material example, there is people who have this disease called epilepsy. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've heard of it, or maybe even you know people with it. So ep epilepsy is a derangement of the airs in the body in a negative way, which causes these kinds of what we call uh, they call them epileptic fits, where people will start to go a little bit wild and mad. It's the life airs are, what we say, severely affected in the wrong way. And therefore, it comes out in these. And people also experience a kind of madness. People will talk complete nonsense. This is also due to the life airs affecting the mind. So when the life air is affected by the soul's love for Krishna in contact with the different elements, then certain ecstatic symptoms start to manifest. Like that. Um, those who are, have reached this platform of Ashak uh, or Bhava, there are certain symptoms that are characteristics of that. And this is mentioned in the Nectar of Devotion. And I'll read these characteristics, which are nine in number. One, 
A person is tolerant and unperturbed even when faced with very distressful situations. That's one. Two, utilization of time. Extremely eager to use every moment in service to the Lord. Three is similar to two. A very strong aversion to wasting time. Sometimes when one is on this platform, if someone wastes their time, they become angry. Uh, like that. And we can give you an example of how Srila Prabhupada did things. Prabhupada, when he would chant his noon Gayatri, a lot of times, as soon as he chanted his Lung Gayatri, he would have to go somewhere and leave to go to for, for lunch or for someplace. And he would have his small group of devotees who would be accompanying him. So Prabhupada would sit down and chant his Gayatri. But Chant Prabhupada chanted Gayatri quite fast. And the other devotees would also chant their Gayatri along with Prabhupada. And when Prabhupada would finish, he would get up and leave. He wouldn't wait for the other devotees. If you weren't ready to go when Prabhupada was ready to go, you were left behind. <laughs> this is the way how Prabhupada did things. Of course, his personal servant was always ready to move according to his command. And so Prabhupada never wasted one moment of time outside of serving Krishna. He was always in that mood. So this is a symptom of one who has love for Krishna. Or in this case, describes it on the platform of Baba. One thinks themselves not very good about themselves. They feel like they have no love for Krishna. This is, another, this is the fourth symptom. But Along with that fourth symptom, there's a complete conviction that they will attain Krishna. There is what is called uh, great hope. Great hope that even though I feel worthless, still I have this strong conviction that I will get Krishna. The next one, number six, is eager to attain perfection affection and a very strong ta taste for chanting the holy names of the Lord. The seventh characteristic is strong attachment and hearing and chanting Krishna's pastimes and his qualities. Mm -hmm. Number eight is this person is not interested in anything not directly connected to Krishna. Number nine and they have love for the pastime places of Krishna. In other words, they are very much attracted to visit in holy places such as Vrindavan, Mayapur, you know, Hardwar, Rishikesh, you know, uh, <clears throat> Rameshwara, like that. The various holy Bajrin, Bajrinath. These are many. And the tirtas that are spread throughout the world, of course, most of them are in India, but they have a strong desire to visit these holy places and they like to hear the pastimes of the Lord connected with these places. There are people who want to imitate this level of devotion and they're, they're described as pretentious. And uh, the actual word in Sanskrit is sahajya, one who takes things cheaply. And so we find, at least you don't see it so much in Western countries, but in India, there are people who like to imitate ecstatic symptoms in public just to present themselves as being on the high level of loving Krishna. There was one situation where Prabhupada was in Vrindavan and he was in his room. Somehow one man came in, somehow he got past the guards and came in. 
And then he started to speak something in Hindi to Prabhupada, and then he fell on the ground and start rolling on the ground. And Srila Prabhupada, you know, he wasn't interested. And so his servant uh, was also there and he was watching, he was thinking, oh boy, this man, he has such bhakti, you know, such ecstasy. So Prabhupada said, just kick him and see what happens. So he did. <laughs> And the man got up and ran out. So, you know, this is so much for their sad, static symptoms. Prabhupada says they show some ecstasy, but then after they make their display, they go light up a beady cigarette. So there's a class of people who are known as sahajias, those who take things cheaply, who like to imitate these types of symptoms, but these things are not to be imitated they come automatically as one progresses through the, through the different stages of bhakti. Okay. Well, this is some of the characteristics on this platform. We'll read some more. Let's see. One is naturally attracted to Krishna. Rupa Goswami compares the stage of Baba to the rays of the sun and Prema, which is the complete, uh, complete love for Krishna as the sun itself. So this is like the rays of the sun moving towards the sun. <laughs> These are symptoms of Prema, but Prema hasn't really fully developed yet. Uh, Nam Sankirtan is the most foremost practice for a person like that. They chant all the time, practically. Mm -hmm. And then there's, of course, certain symptoms. Uh, there is affection for Krishna. There's, just, there's jealousy, possessiveness, attachment, ecstasy, and high ecstasy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I just thought we mentioned a little bit about this stage of bhava. Um, it's not something to be imitated. It has to be, it develops nicely. And um, unless we develop an attraction to hear and chant the holy name of the Lord, a natural attraction, uh, these symptoms won't, we, these stages won't manifest. We'll stay on the lower level. So it's very important that devotees make a vow to somehow or other purify their chanting where they can free themselves from all the aparads that come with wrong chanting or what we say inattentive chanting and move forward on the stages of bhakti because uh, this process is very wonderful. It's the soul's pure nature, nitya siddha krishna prema saru kavunoi sravanari siddhi jitte kodiye udoi in the hearts of all living beings pure love for krishna is situated naturally it's not something to be brought in from the outside it's not something to be learned it is there it's just like you may uh, you may be in your house and you play you something very valuable you put away many years ago and now you're trying to find it but somehow you can't find it you know it's in the house somewhere but somehow everywhere you look it's not there but you know it's there so our love of God is like that. It's like the hidden treasure within the heart that is there. We know it's there, but it has to be uncovered through the process of hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. This remains the foremost practice in awakening that pure love for Krishna. And here's some of the symptoms like that. 
When we lose a lover in this world, we sometimes cry. We shed tears, a family member or someone who's very close to us. Here, and these tears are tears of what we say, lamentation for the loss of a dear one. But here, these tears are reflections of one's love for Krishna. And they are symptomatic of wanting to connect with Krishna. They want, they're symptomatic of, I want my love for you to grow more and more when I chant your holy name. And this is again, this, ver this verse mentions at least two times the, the chanting of the holy name. Okay, and so these are some of the characteristics of the level of bhava. And so um, the rest of the explanations on this verse is more or less symptomatic of the types of exp ecstasies that manifest and how they manifest. <laughs> and what are the symptoms like that? Well, what is important is that you can compare yourself with these nine stages or these nine characteristics of, of bhava, which are mentioned in the nectar devotion. There's one section, I believe it's in the second or third section of the nectar devotion, the nine symptoms of those on this platform of bhava. So you might want to take some time and look for those and read them and see how much you're developing these symptoms because these are characteristics of one who's on that stage. Okay, so uh, we can stop here and uh, we'll open it up for some discussion. Thank you, Maharaj, for a beautiful class. Thank you very much. Uh, devotees, if there are any questions or comments, please go ahead. Pranams Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Shri Prabhupada. All glories to you. This is Shilpa. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Um, we were in our Sangha and we were discussing um, Krishna's mercy. Um, it was more about the causeless mercy that Krishna gives us. So, can, and we were getting quite confused as to the difference between mercy and causeless mercy. Um, can you just explain a little bit about that causeless mercy, Marsh? Mercy is something you get all the time, and causeless mercy is something that comes by way of the by way of the uh, decision of Krishna. The mercy you get all the time is the chanting of the holy name, that's mercy. Prashadam, that's mercy. Association with devotees, that's mercy. Uh, the philosophy, that's mercy. Coming to the programs, and that's mercy. Uh, mercy is, is constantly the feature of, of the process of bhakti. Causeless mercy has a cause, but you can't see it. It's, it says it's causeless because you don't know the cause, that's why. But there is a cause, and that cause is Krishna. But generally, that cause manifests itself because of something about you, either your name, your mood, or... Um, I mean, we can give you an example. Lord Chaitanya has opened the storehouse of love of God and he's distributing the contents to everyone. And some people don't even want it, but still because they're in somehow or other, they get connected to a devotee or they're in, they come to a place where the kirtan is going on, they get some benefit. And at the same time, they also become attracted. That's causeless mercy. It's not about anything they did, but it is about something they did. It's something you can't see. It's either their previous karma 
Samagyata Sukriti, something. Yata Sukriti means unknowingly performing devotional service. It's like if you, just like you may be walking and uh, you drop something and you don't know you dropped it. And then someone comes up and said, oh, excuse me, madam, but uh, I think you dropped this. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, I, uh, thank you very much for returning. Now, they don't know, but they did a service to, to a devotee. Because you are a devotee, they did service to you. So they get what is called the Gyata Sukriti, unknowing, unknowingly performing devotional service. So that's an example how it works. So a lot of times, because of a Gyata Sukriti that people have performed, this mercy manifests in some, some way or other. They get a book. They meet a devotee, they hear the kirtan, something, or in our own day-to-day -day life, something happens that Krishna arranges for us to get some realization. So this is another category of causes mercy. So this is really one of the main answers to your question, along with what we already described, and that is realization is causeless mercy. Realizing something about devotional service. Realization is a stage higher than knowledge because knowledge leads to realization. And realization is the complete understanding of the knowledge. It is more like that, that knowledge which is intuitive. So you might realize, oh, I'm not this body. Oh, my name is Shilpa, but this is what I am in this life. I wonder who I was in my last life and my, like that. So we might get a realization about our present situation. It becomes, it's almost like when you walk into a room and it's dark and then you hit the light switch, the light goes on. As soon as the light comes on, you're able to see everything in the room. Before then, you can't. So in the same way, uh, causeless mercy gives light to the knowledge of bhakti. That's Krishna. He does it. Or it comes through the mercy of the spiritual master. It's coming by the mercy of the spiritual master, but it's coming from Krishna. So um, the question came from the Sangha was um, how how is Krishna's um, how is he giving us causeless mercy? Because if we have to surrender in order to get that mercy. So on Krishna's part, should we be asking about his motive, why he should give us that mercy? No. No. No, you just, it just comes. It can come anytime. Sometimes it comes to a brand new person who has, who's just came to Bhakti, maybe yesterday. They get some causeless mercy. Krishna does that just to give them something, some boost in Krishna consciousness. It's, it's, it's just like there was, there was this, um, I don't know, maybe it's before your time. There was this uh, show on TV, it was called The Millionaire. And uh, the main person in the show was our former president of the United States, Ronald Reagan. He was, a, he was a movie actor. He was a TV actor before he became president. Now, Ronald Reagan um, was working for this millionaire who you never saw. He was just a voice on the screen. So he would call Ronald Reagan and say, 
here is a check for $1 million. Give it to this person. So he would write out a check for a million dollars and Ronald Reagan would get it. And then he would go to this person, knock on their door and say, here, this is a gift of $1 million coming from an anonymous donor. And they would say, oh, wow, I'm so happy. What did I do to get this? And there was no answer. In other words, somehow this millionaire just pick, pick and choose whoever he wanted to give it to and just would send the money. So that's the same thing. Krishna just wants to give it, he'll give it. If he doesn't want to give it, you don't get it. <laughs> Well, that's God. He can do that. Is that clear? Um, I think so, Marge. Um, I, just... think I, I can't explain it any more clearer than that. If somebody wants to show some something nice to you, and you can't understand why, and they just do it, hmm. causes mercy. <laughs> can't you understand that? It's so simple to understand. The person, who has, the person who has the mercy is giving the mercy. And that's Krishna. He's giving it to you. Causeless means you can't understand why, but it, it comes in different ways. It comes in realization. <laughs> of your position in Krishna consciousness, it comes a realization of knowledge. I gave you the example of that TV show. That's perfect. That's a perfect example. This, this wealthy person just wanted to give something to another person. When Krishna wants to give you something, he gives it. <laughs> What's so hard to understand about that? It's easy. Krishna loves everyone. So if he wants to show his love by giving something that you don't deserve, that's causes mercy. You don't deserve it, but you're getting it anyway. Or you do deserve it, but you can't figure out what you did to deserve it. That's all simple. Why is it so hard? Am I speaking a different language? Jay Maharaj, I think um, you're so right. I think sometimes we get caught up in asking questions, but it is simple. And sometimes I think I make it overcomplicated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if I, say, if I say go to your nose and you take your hand and wrap it around your head and point to your nose that way, if you can see me on the screen, can you see me? Can you see me? Yes. Okay. If I say go to your nose and you go like this, that's so. <laughs> if I say if I say go to your nose and you go like this. Thank you, Marsh, for making my Sunday. <laughs> so, so, so easy to understand. If somebody wants to show you something, some favor, and the person has that ability to do it, it's done. <laughs> If you're trying to figure out why it happens, then you may be there your whole lifetime trying to figure it out. <laughs> That's why it's called causeless.
that's that's how we should feel. We don't deserve it, but we're getting it. Just like sometimes senior devotees, when they interact, uh, uh, sometimes they ask how you're doing, and the other one will say, I'm, I should be getting, Krishna is so merciful that he's not, he's allowing me to do some devotional service. He's so merciful. But how are you doing? Better than I deserve. That's the answer. How are you doing better than I deserve? That's causeless. That's an that's that's an indication of causeless mercy, and that's a type of parlance that goes on amongst the devotee. How are you doing? Better than I deserve. It's a symptom of humility, but it's also characteristic of our position. <laughs> Okay, Sopo, you got it? Yes, Maharaj, better than I deserve. <laughs> <laughs> now you, you're beginning to understand. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Uh, Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to you, Guru Maharaj. This is such an enlightening class because it's giving us a chance to understand that how powerful this process of bhakti is. And by sincerely trying, someday we can actually fall in love with Krishna. So it's very wonderful to hear about this process and how we can slowly make progress. My question is, in the course of the lecture, you made a very, um, I think, a very important point. You said, unless we develop a very strong attraction for chanting the holy name, we will remain on a lower level. So we have to make a very strong effort to chant, you know, purely and better. So I think the focus for advancement is right here to, to really perfect our chanting to make it better and better. So would you please help us a little bit by sharing some tips for better chanting? Yeah, not only tips for better chanting, but unless you have a, a what is called a sankalpa. The sankalpa means a vow, but it not, doesn't mean just vow, it means a determined vow. I will chant purely. And then, okay, I'm, this is my goal. So Krishna consciousness means making goals. <laughs> so that's one of the goals that are important to make. I'm going to develop that taste for chanting. So then you have to see, okay, how do I reach the goal? And then there's a whole set of circumstances that can that you can apply. There's certain things you can, what we say, remove that will open the door to attentive and what we say, tasteful chanting. But unless you have that vow, you won't stay steady. You'll go on for a little while and then something else will come up and you'll get diverted. So you have to make that vow. Now, how to keep the vow strong, that's also a process. Making the vow is one thing, fueling the vow with the positive reinforcement, that's part of the process of bhakti. So one of the things that you can do is that when you see yourself or you observe yourself chanting inattentively, 
should immediately stop and start chanting attentively. You should be very much aware how much you're hearing at every minute. You shouldn't be in a, you shouldn't be like somewhere else and then the, the, the sound of the holy name is going on, but you're not with it. When you recognize that that is happening immediately, you bring your consciousness back to hearing the sound vibration. And if you practice that regularly, and it requires that regular practice, you'll start to develop your attentiveness in the process of chanting. And attentiveness leads to uh, various types of realizations on, about Krishna, about bhakti, about your relationship with Krishna, because everything is coming from the holy name. Because the holy name is Krishna fully in sound vibration. So make that vow. And then um, do what's necessary. I mean, there's a whole book. I'm reading it right now. It's all about making vows and how to develop the vows and how to stay attentive in the process of bhakti. This is the thing. We lose attention easily. We get attentive to something and then we get distracted and we get and we get pulled into other directions. Stay attentive to Krishna consciousness. Even if you have to do things in the material world, it doesn't mean you have to forget Krishna while you're doing it. Somehow or other, stay connected with Krishna. That attention, when it becomes uh, developed, it becomes uh, different stages of remembering Krishna. Smartam dasa, it goes from smartam to varnam, from varnam, this is, this is from uh, remembering to, uh, and remembering to absorption, absorption to you know, intense absorption, and ultimately to the stage of complete absorption or samadhi. Samadhi is like you lose awareness of everything but the object that you're, uh, we're not on that platform of samadhi, but that's, I'm just giving you an indication what samadhi is. Samadhi means you, you're connected with the sound of the holy name completely, and you're not even aware of your existence. You have no awareness of your body or anything else. You're simply in the holy name. So take that and bring it down to lesser stages of absorption. And these are the different stages that we go through. So we have to practice attentive devotional activities. Be attentive to reading. Be attentive to serving. Be attentive to chanting. Be attentive to whatever you're doing. Keep that mind focused. That's bhakti because this is bhakti yoga and yoga means connection. If we're not connected, we're not in the process of yoga. And connection comes from attentiveness. Attentiveness is fueled by determination in a certain direction. We apply that just like when we live in the material world when we go to school, we become very attentive to our studies. So we get the best parts of possible marks on our exam. And that way we're situated nicely after graduation and we have a great opportunity to get a position based on our, what we say, successful education. Stay attentive. <clears throat> very nicely explained, Guru Maharaj. You have, it's a very comprehensive explanation of the stages step by step, how to go 
as you were speaking, I was just uh, wondering, would you recommend that all of us uh, disciples, we just uh, meet once a week online on Zoom to discuss our challenges and then how we want to improve, set goals for ourselves, keep ourselves accountable like that and uh, improve our chanting? As long as it's, it's not a crying session, <clears throat> if it's a crying session where everybody's complaining about what's not happening, then it's not going to work. It should stay positive on what we need to do to move forward. Okay, I think maybe some more reflection is needed on that one. Yeah, if you just go in, everyone's going to just, uh, you know, dump the garbage. It's not, it's not going to really bring anything. Well, we want to say, well, you know, this is my level of practice. I'm trying to understand more. In other words, we can bring you bring up topics to discuss. If you're going to meet, discuss topics. So maybe we can uh, discuss uh, an inspiring quote on the Holy Name or some uh, book that we have read, say the Nectarian Ocean of the Holy Name and uh, share uh, some quotes and then help ourselves to focus like that and make our chanting better. Is that what you want to do? Yeah, I was thinking because each of us is struggling alone. It, this COVID makes everything so isolated. So if we just come together and discuss how to make our chanting better, maybe we'll get uh, some realization simply by uh, is what, what strategies they are using for making their chanting better and we can learn from each other like that. I'm, I'm just thinking. Sadhu Sangha. <laughs> That's the basis. We, our Sadhu Sangha has been diverted into a kind of a media type of Sangha now through the, through the uh, computer, through these various agencies. But it's still Sadhu Sangha. So use that, use that media to associate. And if you can associate on a personal level, wherever you are with other devotees, that's better. <laughs> but in any case, associate. Association brings discussion on Krishna, discussion on the process of bhakti, it also makes you happy because by nature we are social beings. We like to be with other people in a positive way. <laughs> Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada and all glories to you. I was kind of following up with uh, what Sri Devi was talking about. Um, it would seem, I, I don't know, can we manifest certain, can one manifest some of these qualities of bhava, but if the chanting is not uh, pure, then are we actually at that, at that stage of bhava? Or can you manifest some of those qualities and be on that stage? These things can come intermittently at any time. They can even come to a brand new person. But because that person is not on that stage, they're just, they're just experiences that come and go. That's all. Just like sometimes a new person will uh, walk into a temple and hear the kirtan or hear or just feel the whole atmosphere and start crying and feeling really happy. Their heart and mind was in the right place. Again, the life fair, when the life fair connects in a certain way to a particular element, a certain symptom manifests. So that can happen to anybody at any time, but that's not the Baba stage. The Baba stage means continuous. So all of those qualities need to be manifested. Well, they'll come. But the nine, the nine characteristics is what you should gauge yourself on. Those are the nine symptoms. Not wanting to waste time. 
attraction for the holy name, great hope that I can get Krishna. These are all of the symptoms of the, of the stage of bhava. And as I mentioned, it's in the nectar of devotion. You can find it. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Guru Maharaj. Yeah. Uh, it's a wonderful process. Bhakti is so nice that even if you fail, you win. You can't lose. It's not possible. Anyone who takes up bhakti is on the winning platform. It's just a matter of time before you reach perfection. But we want, we want to reach perfection as direct as we can. So we have to see how much we can make progress by following. So therefore, we should be very serious about this. Because if we get again diverted to the material energy and start taking up material life or still have attachment to the material world, then we take birth in another situation. <laughs> and then we have to, we may also have to again go through our purification of material desires. So bhakti is so nice and it's very powerful. It's the internal energy of Krishna. It's, it's Ladini Shakti. It is Radharani herself. Bhakti Yoga is Radharani herself. Okay. Now, now it looks, it, it's helping. I think the other day when I had asked about devotional service, I was referring to, to Radharani and uh, the Hladini Shakti, but I understand that it's beyond, it's, it's the soul where it comes from, the devotional, the, the idea of devotion. It's in the soul. That's you, the soul. You have pure love for God. It's already there. You don't have to do anything except uncover it. We use the example, you have something in your house you can't find, but it's there, you know. Mm -hmm. So love of God is, is situated in the heart of the devotee. Pure love. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. That's the greatest treasure. If you get that treasure, you have received, you have perfected all of your millions of lives in this material world. Everything you've gone through has become successful because you've reached the, the goal of, of, of existence. Our goal of existence is to exchange love with Krishna. That's it. <laughs> Simple to explain, difficult to achieve. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is merciful. He's made it a lot easier. And he emphasizes two things. Chant the holy names. Like today is Ekadasi. If we're doing 16 rounds today and that's all we're doing, we really don't understand what the benefits of Ekadasi. Ekadasi means japa. <laughs> <clears throat> we should be chanting the whole day. At least the majority of the day, we should be chanting. Why do we have to continue with our routine activities every day? When a codice is called mother of devotion. It, it, there's special mercy on this day, just like they, they were talking about causes mercy. This today is a day where there's extra mercy available and it comes through chanting. So Vaishnavas in India, those who follow strictly, all they do is chant for 24 hours. They get up and they begin at the beginning of the Akadasi TT, which is usually around sometime in the early morning hours. And they chant 24 hours to the next, next day, 24 hours, that's all. 
we can't do that. Our mind and senses are just, we'll just keep rebelling, but we should try to chant as much as we can. Thank you, Manasi Ganga. That's just some of the, uh, this is from Nectar of Devotion you found. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, so on Sunday, I have to conclude right at the hour because I always have a, another engagement right after, after the one hour session. I'm not able to stay with the Japa, but please everyone chant one round. And uh, from there, just keep chanting. Thank you, Maharaj, <clears throat> for a beautiful Thank session. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All glories to Srila All glories. Oh, and you, today, Maharaj. yeah, those of you who are interested today at in two hours, when, I'm sorry, not in two hours, in three hours, at uh, four o'clock UK time, I'll be giving a session to the devotees in Rijeka, Croatia, on chanting the holy names of the Lord. So um, that link was sent to the conference by Tushar. And uh, so just find the link. And uh, if you'd like to come online, and that's at four o'clock UK time, which is exactly three hours from now. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Guru Maharaj, is it uh, four o'clock or five o'clock, Guru Maharaj? Because the link says uh, it's five o'clock UK time. No. Four o'clock UK time, five o'clock my time. Okay. Um, let me see. Let me. I'll send you the link again. I have it here on my computer. Yeah, so. Tushar Prabhu sent it to me already. Guru Maharaj, I have shared with the group, um, but it says five o'clock UK time. So just want to confirm with you again. Okay. Let, let me. Mm, well, if you're early, then you'll know it, that it's not, it's an hour later, but don't be late. Yes, Guru Maharaj, sure. Okay. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj.